all need help, but many of us can't ask for it. Research tells us that at least one in four of us will be impacted by mental health. And yet accessing help and asking for it remains highly stigmatized. In the UE alone, a Ministry of Health report also reported that it could cost the UAE economy $5 billion. And across the world, it currently is projected to cost, in terms of absenteeism and loss of production, $5 trillion, which is set to rise to $6 trillion by 2030. So why is this such a big problem and why across workplaces, both here in the region and globally, is this largely still an unspoken? But I'm glad today to be joined once again by Sir Ian Cheshire, who heads up the Global Business Collaboration for Better Workplace Mental Health. So Ian, thank you again for joining us on AB Talks. So we've spoken before and our audience has also um, seen you before, but for those who missed our first interview, just give us a, a helicopter view, if you can, of uh, the GBC, the work you're doing, who signed up and what the vision is. Great. Well, look, thanks for that, Scott. And the GBC is essentially, uh, literally, as it says on the title, a global business collaboration. Uh, it's been started um, by a handful of truly global companies um, who are seeking to, in some senses, build on their involvement in previous campaigns like Head Together with the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge yep. uh, in the UK, but to come up with a global answer uh, and, and very much focus on the, the, the workplace challenge, mental place work, workplace challenge. So um, it was started very much by, uh, I mean, the full list of HSBC, um, BP, uh, Salesforce, Unilever, BHP, Pippa Chance, WPP and Deloitte, um, all of whom have extensive global footprints. Um, uh, and I think what we've tried to do is to focus on two main issues, really, which is how can uh, we in the various countries around the world come together to help break down the uh, stigma around discussing mental health at work. And I think one of the reasons, as per your introduction, is uh, that this is still an issue and remains a, a massive issue, you know, 12 billion workdays a year lost through, through mental health, is that if people aren't talking about it and engaging with it, it gets driven out and all you see is the, net, the after effects. So the stigma is the starter to doing something about it, but you have to tackle the stigma. The second element is to understand what are the practical real world tools uh, that can help managers and colleagues in businesses. And I think what we're trying to do there is essentially collaborate uh, with existing, uh, sharing existing knowledge and existing programs and all the founders have got phenomenal efforts and resources and try and replicate to some extent what we do in the UK, which is a mentalhealthatwork.org.uk. It's a website which allows you, if you don't have the facilities, you don't have the training, is to go and find what other people have done. So businesses are trying to share, this isn't competitive, this is, we found what works, and we're also working on things like the business case for investing in mental health, all of which is about helping equip managers and colleagues um, in what is a very difficult area. And a lot of managers are very scared about broaching this topic, saying the wrong thing, uh, coming up with the wrong answer. And so what we're trying to say is, look, this is a pragmatic, really sensible business thing. This is about allowing our teams to be more productive, more engaged, happier, and how do we help them and support them because that's good for business and it's good for our contribution to society, but in a really pragmatic business way. So I'm going to play devil's advocate and kind of repeat things that I hear in this market uh, right yep. now, which is, look, we're all vaccinated. We're all back in the office, certainly out here, uh, you know, back in the UK, I know you're heading back to the office. So pandemic over, mental health crisis averted, no? Now, I think, in fact, uh, to my mind, Scott, the, the absolute inverse is true, which is that yeah. I think the hidden impact on mental health through this has been you know, much worse than people think. And we're seeing it pop up, I think, as people do start to come back and become more visible. Um, so I think we've stored up quite a, a large negative impact, which we've got to as leaders help manage and help the teams manage. The only positive side, I'd say, again, the other way, I'm the, the devil's advocate, the angel's advocate, maybe, is... Um, I've been really struck by the way leadership teams, CEOs around the world, um, partly because they're on Zoom, much more directly in contact with people, yeah. have really engaged with this topic in a way that I would have said five years ago, I'm not sure they would have been willing to talk about it, that when they say, how are you feeling? It's not just a polite thing. It's generally, look, we were actually generally interested in this because we, we need to know you're okay. 
And I think the level of acceptance, which is one of the reasons why the GBC has started this year in 2021, is that you're getting CEO level support for this in a way that I think is, is really game changing. And, and that I think helps set the tone, which allows them people to get on. So I think it's, it's going to be a big continuing issue for us. Um, and we don't, won't know the full impact of pandemic, but it's quite clear you can't have general health without mental health. And so this is, I think, the opportunity to step into the area. I'll come back to that in a minute, but you're talking about the kind of the acceptance and the CEOs, which was a question I was going to bring in later, but I'll ask it now. I mean, we've got a few things going on. We've seen the Olympics and we've seen Simona Biles. We've seen, you know, uh, Naomi Osaka at the French Open. We've even seen Nike giving their uh, you know, employees off, a week off for stress. Mm. Um, and we also have this growing drumbeat of ESG, which... Yeah is now no longer just the environment it is the governance and it is how you treat your people do you feel this is is it beginning to bed in and what do we need to do now for it to actually take root and take hold yeah. you seeing the green yeah. shoots are we yeah yes yeah, Scott I, mean, I think we are seeing the green shoots uh, and in some cases more than that I think we're seeing substantive change I mean I've seen a number of organizations where the uptake on uh, mental health work support tools has been phenomenal. I mean, massive growth in the last um, 18 months. Um, I think I'd say again, two things on this one, which is um, we're very conscious with the, the glo this is a global business collaboration that different uh, geographies are at different points in this journey and that some yeah. people have only just started. And in some cases, you know, there's real sensitivity and real reluctance to even start the conversation. So, I think you've got uneven distribution of green shoots, as it were. And in some places, we haven't got a lot of evidence of anything coming up. And one of the things we're trying to do with the GBC is to create hubs in, in real, you know, places like UAE, uh, in China and India and in Latin America. And so, right, how does the cultural framework work here that allows us to start having a conversation? Because what we don't want to do is have a sort of uh, northern uh, white Brit version of this. This has got to be what's fit for purpose in each country and everyone approaches it in quite different ways. Um, so finding the right cultural answer for the right uh, geographies is, is a really big part of this and I think while the theme of stigma is very much the same around the world actually it plays out very differently in different places and so we don't want a one size fits all, it wants to be locally driven. Second thing is this focus on practical uh, you know, tools and practical interventions. So what works rather than some sort of warm, fuzzy, well, we're doing it because we think it's an ESG obligation and we want to be decent people, and that's great. But actually, it's got to be much more, more grounded and, and, and real than that. It's like, well, what actually works? You know, what interventions make sense? What yeah. training for management really actually works? And where are the pinch points on this that where you can catch people? And it's not about treating the extreme cases of mental health. It's saying, how do I generally improve this so that my workplace is a positive experience and it, I get the best, uh, you know, from the team because you're supporting the team the best way. And there's just a long list of things that you can start to get to. So it's getting to action now with practical tools that's most important. Are you winning the financial argument? Are you winning the business case argument? Because I know we've talked about this in the past, mm. but, you know, you see the figures, every, you know, the for every dollar spent in this space, you get $4 back. And I've long said, I don't know why the chief financial officers are not championing this, you know, because <laughs> there's a real, you know, if it's on the bottom, if, if there's a real impact on the bottom line. Um, yeah. Is there a growing body of evidence that backs that up and eventually you can now sit and support the CEOs and go, want to make more money? Do the right thing. Yeah. Yeah, no, and, and um, I hesitate to spring to the defense of CFOs around the world, but I would be fair to them. They, You've been they a minority. Actually, <laughs> yeah, my, well, my experience has been that they're, they're pretty pragmatic, as long as they don't think it's just being fluffy and, and sort, of, uh, sort of greenwash it, as it were. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, and one of the things we are doing for um, through the GBC collaboration is to assemble uh, real world case studies to show to people that when we talk about that four to one return, we are serious. And, you know, there's a stat from Deloitte saying that, you know, engaged and, and uh, happy and, and healthy employees are 13% more productive. And if you do the sums, all the work we've done in the early days suggests there is a really strong business case. Um, but the but, I think, is this point about show me stuff that actually works as opposed yeah. to just sort of saying, 
I can justify any amount of money because it's a good thing, you know, and yeah. that's been, I think, some of the dangers here. It says, look, we're not going to say, you know, there is no sort of boundary on this, but financially, investing in supporting your teams is an incredibly good outcome financially. And, and actually helping the CFOs see the business case is something we can do because the, certainly the founders, in my experience, have been through that journey and yeah. they get it. So I, mean, I just want to pick on one thing you said there. So you said the, res the research by Deloitte showed that there was a 13% increase in productivity. Yeah. In productivity. Uh, I mean, yeah. I think if, if, the, if the board sat down and asked for ideas and went, well, how are, gonna, how are we going to increase productivity the, 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 this, you know, this year team? And you went, well, I've got an easy win here that's going to give you 13% extra. Most yeah. of them would, would take that blind, wouldn't they, if they didn't know what it was that you were actually proposing? Completely, yeah. If you, if you dress it up as a piece of new software or something, they'd say, right, buy it. Um, yeah. But I, I think this, you know, the cr critical thing there is, well, is, okay, so how do you actually deliver that? You know, what, what are the yeah. four or five useful interventions that you can make? And I think what's really encouraging is that we've got enough um, track record now already um, before we get further down the line that the founders can point to real data so that we can actually show you how this works. And we can distinguish between the you know, nice to haves where you could spend a lot of money but not get anywhere, where actually there are some particular interventions where you really do make a difference. Uh, and to my mind, one of the most important bit is yeah. figuring out the right training for the managers who are leading teams so that they are confident enough to actually get into that conversation. Because a big part of what we've seen in the workplace is people going, yeah, I know this is really important. I know I ought to be doing something, but I'm absolutely terrified that I'm going to yeah. say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. And bits of this are difficult because it does ask you, you know, it will ask you to think about things like how you do performance reviews, how, what's the working environment like, how, how are you managing work-life balance and, and stress in the workplace? And I think businesses a long time ago were a bit embarrassed about this and felt that, you know, well, we're, are we causing the problem so we can't talk about it and it's not yeah. appropriate? I think we're now at a much better place, much healthier place, which says, look, this would be great. If we can get everyone, you know, functioning better, it's, it's a great outcome for everyone and it makes perfect business sense. And now the question is, well, what exactly do we do? Is there a trust issue here as well? Because, um, you know, not only do we have it from the management side, but we've also got the yeah. you know, employees have to engage with this and trust that anything that they say won't be weaponized against them. Um, and that's terrific a point. Challenge. Yeah, terrific point. I mean, there's a really depressing statistic in, in the early work we did on Heads Together when we did the first bit on workplace. And it was only 2% of the people we talked to would, would want to talk to their HR department about a mental health issue, which just tells you the volumes. And what I think that is, is actually, it's not, it's not blaming the HR department, it's a leadership and trust issue, which says yeah. you have got to make the organisation a safe space uh, to talk about this and which starts with leaders saying we're willing to accept this as part of our responsibility and that again I don't think was the case when I certainly started my working career and then the second part of it is to say I don't believe it's something you assign to a specialist HR function this is about you as leaders really understanding your team's position and their well-being and you as a leader being trained enough not to be a mental health professional that's not what we're saying it's to actually create the conditions where people can feel comfortable asking for help and then go out and on on this point i think it is it's the hardest thing for people in the organization to sort of get comfortable with and it'll, it'll take a lot of leadership repetition to say absolutely okay to talk about this you know this is not the way that you lose your job yeah. and i don't expect that to happen overnight frankly but that's where great leadership in the business world can really transform the workplace and, and make it safe. But it is going to take personal effort by, by leaders uh, up and down the organisation. Now, if I'm a leader and I'm looking at this and, and perhaps I don't, don't know where to get started and the like. So we've talked about increasing productivity. Is there a, another dimension to this as well? Because if I look at certainly my region right now, there's an absolute dearth of talent. Um, and is there an aspect of A, talent retention, and be yeah. talent attraction and what's the you know what's the risk in actually not addressing this particularly when we look at the us and we see the headlines like yeah. the, you know the, the great resignation lots of people resigning to go places where they can actually have a better life have we simply yeah. just had enough of toxic workplaces 
I, I think that has been a really interesting um, sort of sub theme of the pandemic is that it's forced a lot of people to reassess what they're doing, why they're doing it, and what their other options might be. And uh, I think from, a, again, your point for the leaders is looking at, at the future and saying, well, what type of talent do we want to attract? How can we work with them? And this is going to be a, a global war for talent, no, no yeah. doubt about it. And organizations that can't demonstrate their ability to work in this, on this topic in this area, I think will suffer. So I, I think if you're thinking seriously about your talent strategy and your culture and what you want to achieve, this is a, a must do, it's not, it's not, a, it's not an optional one. What, what everyone has to figure out is how does it work, how do these issues get there in that particular culture in that organization. So, so I don't think there is a, a sort of mechanistic, right, if you hit the following five things, you're done. What you've got to work out is for that type of culture, this is the type of you know, solution that we're looking for. But it starts with this senior level commitment. And I think the, the talent point that you make is a really great one because I think as a C, in the C-suite, that's a real worry for people. How the hell do we attract these talent, particularly in some of the digital uh, sides of the businesses where you know, the, the competition for talent is, is, is ridiculous. You said uh, just a little earlier that sort of mental health is general health and general health is mental health. What does that actually look like in a workplace? I mean, if we look at practically, do, 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 do sick leave policies need to change? Do, 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 is, yep. is mental health sort of first aid now as important as physical first aid in the workplace? Yep. Absolutely. And, and look, I think it's, it's worth saying, I mean, I think the workplace mental health start, I mean, it probably comes from a background, which is where health and safety at work was maybe 50 years ago. You know, it, there was a level of assumption about bad things happen, people get killed on building sites, you know, people do all sorts of things. And so the journey that's gone on, on on physical well-being, I think, is the one that mental health is, is on its way. So to have the knowledge that you've got a physical first aider in the building in every office and you've got the chart on the wall, yeah. where, where's the mental health first aider? And I think that is in the last five years actually is one area which has shifted quite a lot. Um, but you're absolutely right to say this needs a holistic integrated picture which says well how do we tackle well-being at work and it's got a strong physical commitment where, where probably to be honest a lot of the work was already done 10 15 years ago about you know the rights of the environment um as i say absentee policy health health cover various other things the mental health piece of this is, is really in slightly catch-up mode and i think that's the bit that we're adding if you like into that um, conclusion but it does take a holistic view about well, what's the workplace in, in totality for physical and, and mental well-being. Mm -hmm. And the point being that we're trying to maximize people's well-being. We're not just trying to treat your person who's had a crisis. This is about everyone. I'm not going to ask you to get too political, but is this something, I mean, uh, um, uh, but, you know, a physical first aid and, and health and safety, that, that's actually set down in law. That's legislation. Yeah. Does legislation actually need to evolve to embrace mental health in terms of the workplace? Yeah, I think, I mean, what we've seen is a much greater focus, in the, in certainly in the UK and in other places around, around the world, much greater focus on, on the important me mental health generally. Mental health in the workplace hasn't really had a particular sort of legislative push, but um, the, the, in, in all the pieces of work that we've seen in the UK, certainly, is rising up up the list now i think there is a sort of question mark about how much further that can go but there are also frankly some bits of old legislation around the world um which are um genuinely sort of archaic i mean you've got you know suicide is criminalized in 150 countries for example yeah. let's just give you one piece um equally uh some of the um you know, frankly, the lunatics laws is what they're actually called from, I think, probably courtesy of the Brits in the 19th century still exist in quite a few countries. Yeah. So there is one of the things that we will look at uh, as the GBC is to say, look, where are there areas where we think a legislative shift in each country maybe is something we should call for? So we're not going to shy away from that. But the main focus of what we're interested in is getting practical action from business on the ground and work together on the ground to make change. So and try and work with inside the corporations rather than? Well, I think we'll lend our, absolutely lend our voice to those that are calling for the right type of legislation, so why wouldn't we? Um, but actually there's so much to do just by getting on and, and fixing some of the practical stuff. There's no issue with, you know, not doing that, but it, actually we've got a lot of other things we can do in the meantime.
So um, again, we've, we have spoken about this in the past, but just remind our audience about the pledge that you ask your members to sign up to and what, what's the kind of vision and the hope behind that? Well, what we did with the six point pledge, and I won't run through that entire thing, but it's, it's available on the website um, uh, and I'll encourage everyone to look at it, is we took uh, a really hard look at sort of best practice around the world and from our, our various um, members in terms of their, their experience and basically said that if you're going to be serious about the mental health at workplace improvement, you've got to sign up on, on the sort of six points rather than just one or two of them. Mm -hmm. So it was an attempt to say it's a comprehensive pledge, but frankly, at the same time, it's, it's pragmatic and it's actually quite doable and it's not something that you have to achieve, you know, 100% score on day one. This is saying, this is what we're going to aim to improve. This is how we're going to work on it. And what it has the advantage is if by standardizing it into a sort of six point pledge, we can then assemble lots of evidence underneath all of that against each of it. So it's an organizing framework, I guess is the way I'd say it. Um, and we think it, it, it distills the experience of thousands of organizations over the last five, 10 years into where you can do stuff practically. So rather than, I think a lot of businesses when they get into this topic go, oh, okay, I know mental health and wellbeing is important, but what the hell do I do? And because we heard that a lot, we said, well, actually, if you sign up on this pledge and follow our, our, our suggestions or best practice, there's your to-do list basically. And that's, that's the key uh, to give people a practical starting point and then a way in which they can go on their journey. Now we're seeing here, again, companies trying to get back into the office and there's this temptation to reset to default. Yeah. How, big is, how big an issue is it? Um, you know, how, how important is it for companies to resist the urge to reset to default? And indeed, was the default fit for purpose in the first place? Yeah. Great question, Scott. Uh, my personal view, and this is going to be a, uh, it's a topic that's being discussed in all the boardrooms I'm involved with at the moment, so it's absolutely top of the list. I think there's two sides to this, which is um, one, people have discovered they can actually be more productive in flexible working than they thought. So to some extent, we've gone through a massive global experiment by accident of, of trying to see how a different version pre, pre old school would, would look. And I think that's opened quite a lot of people's eyes to you know, actually, um, there's a lot more you can do if, you, if you're correctly set up, got the right tools, right connectivity, et cetera. Um, but, but I think the more subtle one, which is where the leadership challenge comes in, is that I think you recognize that people who've been through this experience don't just want to go back to the same old, same old. They want aspects they like about physical working. They want aspects of uh, remote working, including you know, less commuting, less travel, more family time. And I think you, having removed the productivity worry, you've then got to decide for, I think, almost business by business, but particularly actually almost function by function, which says, what actually is the model that works for you? But if you spend time with the colleagues and the teams, I think they've now got the experience to say, well, we've been through this and we now see this works. And I think, frankly, a form of hybrid is going to become the new. I don't think we're going back to five days in an office. We can't put that genie back in the box there. Nope. Now, we spoke maybe nine months ago, I think. It was in 2020. We were both firmly locked down. Now we're here, uh, you know, uh, looking at the second or well, third quarter of 2021. What's changed for the better or for the worse? Um, I, I bring out two things that I think have fundamentally changed is that I think we've learned to be effective and efficient through um, flexible, you know, remote working in a way that I, I, you know, we could have had the theory of it, but I think we've lived the practice and people yeah got the capability now which says we understand you know basic skills like you know how do you get on zoom how does it work how do you share stuff and i think we've established a platform for working that is as you say you can't put the genie back in the bottle that that is now there and we've got a practical answer and if someone had said i mean these oh, well, we go back to barclays you know if someone had said to 55,000 people across barclays ask the it product team to come up with a plan to, to make everyone work, work remotely. It would have been five years, 500 million pounds of spend and you know, impossible. Yeah, it happened in two and a half weeks. And, and that, that I think has completely changed people's ideas of what's possible. Uh, 
but I think then the other thing is that people have also gone through such a long lockdown that they are identifying the bits of the human experience they miss. And I think what we're coming to is, is a subtler appreciation of actually to enjoy and be you know, mentally well, I need a certain level of interaction and stimulus and, and engagement with other human beings. But I'm going to make sure my time is thought about in a way that's much more intelligent. So I have physical get togethers for things that really are relevant, as opposed to sit through a highly transactional, boring bit of governance, which frankly you can do remotely and don't have to travel for. Um, so I think it, it, it'll be, it won't be one size fits all. I think people will celebrate stuff again. Great, we're all going to get together for, to talk about this and completely something new, recruiting new people, growing new teams. And then the transactional stuff that says, you know what, actually we can do that. We can cut the audit committee to, you know, one hour rather than three and we can get all this red, bang, let's just be more efficient. And I think you're just that shape is, is going to be massively different as a result of those, you know, uh, learnings about how to work and then learnings about what human beings and human contact bring. Um, and and it's certainly we need both. So I've got to ask, as I've got you on, um, how are you feeling? How's your mental health? And are you getting better at talking about it about yourself? Yeah, um, and in fact, it, with some of our other colleagues, it, the first question is, right, score yourself on the day. How are you feeling out of 10? Is this a 6 or 7 or a 10? And, um, you know, to be honest, Scott, uh, there have been some moments in the depths of lockdown when we felt like Groundhog Day and we're just getting up, spending the day in front of a screen and going back yeah. down. And I'd be saying that's, that's about a six or a five day. That wasn't a huge amount of fun. Um, but what I have sort of decided here is that I'm, I'm sort of much more actively managing my time about where I want to be and how I want to be. Yeah. And it, uh, actually today and yesterday, it's, it's, um, it's comfortably an eight, I think, because um, we're actually doing focused, interesting things with people we like. And, and I think that sort of sense of the positive uh, pleasure of working together in a place where you, you're doing interesting things with people like is such an important human dimension. If you're not getting that, you know, your score will slip. So I'm much happier now. And certainly when I compared to Simon 10 years ago, you wouldn't dream of talking seriously about, you know, are you in good or bad shape? Yeah. Um, I, I think it's become much more acceptable and I certainly find it much more useful. And, and by talking about it yourself, you give permission to other people to say, oh, okay, well, you know, I feel this or I feel that. Uh, interest. I think there's a side tip there as well, or maybe a pro hack for the for the audience watching. You were saying there that um, particularly with your time management, you 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 you're almost taking control of your time management a bit, and you're you're happier about that. And the last time we spoke, and you talked about a book called Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, and I went and read it. Uh, oh, good. Yeah, uh, and, you know, incredible book. Um, but again, I think we spoke about, about there, there's still people out there that will be suffering from that kind of loss of perceived control. And, yeah. and, and, and is that a big tactic for people just to feel better about their life, to take control a little bit? Yeah. More? Well, I think that, and, and there's, there's an interesting thing here, which is the illusion of control in most people's lives. You know, this yeah. fact of you, know, you may think you're in control, but actually um, it, it's often nothing to do with it. For the record, because, my wife is in control. But anyway. <laughs> I wasn't going to challenge anything as fundamental as that. Um, my, my sense is that, you know, you go back to this, basic question that if you have I mean, back to Socrates an, an unexamined life is not worth living so thinking carefully about what you're doing and why and what makes you flourish and what makes you you know more productive and more useful and, and more engaged means that you put that as a filter on your activity rather than just right I've got to fill up the day I've got lots of stuff to do and people start to confuse being active with being achieving things and, and, a, and it's a real classic trap of modern working life so to come up and say, actually, I'm really thinking about what am I doing with my time in this place? And to add the filter, which says, how does it make me feel? Because there's some stuff you have to do and you go, right, this may not be particularly brilliant, but I've got to do that. But actually, we have much more choice than we think we have over how we spend our time. And I think if you start working on that, and as you said, with the Victor Frankl thing about the freedom to react to things is ours. It's our choice, our power to decide how we react. We don't have to be trapped by things then you suddenly feel like you actually do get more real control because you choose how you want to spend your time. And I think that's a really important part for all of us to say, you know, how does this nourish me? How does this help me? How do I cut out the bad energy stuff and the stuff that brings me down? Uh, and I think that's a perfectly sensible conversation to have with, with all of us as, as, as teams. And 
I was going to say what the leaderships and what the companies need to kind of learn from that. Because as, as we said, we took, look at the great resignation and, and it feels like there are more people actually having that conversation with themselves. Yeah. So organizations kind of need to recognize that and figure out how to, how to give nourishment to their teams. Otherwise, they could be very lonely all of a sudden. Yeah. I mean, the I mean, a very sort of simplistic answer is that businesses and organisations generally need to have much more honest conversations with their with their teams about what's actually going on and what's working for them and what isn't working for them. And I think uh, one one thing I've certainly noticed in some of the bigger companies is we've all felt that we're sort of doing an okay job of that because we're nice people, we care about people, we're well behaved, we don't uh, set out to cause grief in the workplace. And then when you get one level down into the conversation, you get much greater honesty about this. Actually, there's, there's more discomfort than people may think. And it's just because you, you've done quite a good job doesn't mean that you've, you've done the real job. And that the impact of, you say, the great resignation and the great sort of dislocation that we've seen is I think you're having a much more fundamental re reflection from, from, from all working levels about what they want to do and who they want to work with and why. And that's a great opportunity if you've got a real leadership position to go out, as you said earlier, with the talent program and say, this is a chance to demonstrate that we are a place that will attract great people and look after them. And we do it meaningfully rather than just take them, you know, give them a ping pong table or something like that. This is a genuine uh, inflection point because of this um, period we've been through. And I think um, those that are brave enough to have the real conversations and, and not just say, oh, you're right. Oh, yeah, fine. Great change the topic and go back to work. I think we'll discover a lot of rich conversations in that. That feels like a good mic drop moment to, uh, to, to finish the interview on. Uh, so Ian, thanks for joining us on MB Talks today and we will catch up again. Maybe, maybe let's catch up in, in more than uh, nine months, less than nine months time next time. Less than nine months, that would be great Scott and good luck for, for the back to work process. <laughs>